So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERP is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERP has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <clears throat> Pag nanuli tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basehan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. 
Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget. Or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERPI has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <clears throat> Pag nanuli tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan 
o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basehan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat ring ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS, ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, masipet, lib! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good day, friends, and welcome to our knowledge sharing webinar this morning. I am Rowena Taliping, and I'll be your moderator. Today's topic is very interesting as it will tackle issues on misinformation and disinformation, especially during this time of the pandemic. In this digital age, anybody can share information anytime and anywhere, both true and false, on a massive scale. So the question now is how do we spot new fake news and how do we prevent it from spreading like wildfire? These and other related topics will be discussed by our speakers this morning. But before we do that, may we request our president, Dr. Celia Reyes, for the opening remarks. Ma'am Cel. Thank you, Wing. Um, good morning. Let me acknowledge the following officials who took the time from their busy schedule to join us today. Um, from the government, we have um, our friends, Tariff Commission Chairperson Marilu Mendoza, Philippine Statistical Research and Training Institute Executive Director Josefina Venegas Almeda, Philippine National Volunteer Service Coordinating Agency Executive Director Donald James Gawe, Senate Economic Planning Office Director Sir Ces Nitafan, Director of Foreign Affairs Director Patricia Barrera, House of Representatives Electoral Tribunal Director Rico Umaga, Department of Education Director June Arvin Gudoy, Philippine Information Agency Regional Director William Beltran, Commission on Population and Development Regional Director Lidio Espanol, Department of Science and Technology Regional Director Nancy Bantog, 
Department of Science and Technology Picard Division Director Richard Amansek and Director Marita Carlos, Civil Service Commission Director Maria Teresa Fernandez, National Economic and Development Authority Director Joseph Lalog, Department of Budget and Management Director Vivian Labastilla, Department of Public Works and Highways Director Andra Santiago, Department of Social Welfare and Development Director Irene Dumlao, Department of Information and Communications Technology Director Maria Teresa Garcia, Banco Central ng Pilipinas Deputy Director Maria Lourdes Manalang, and um, Deputy Director Cristina Garrido Ho and Deputy Director Lea Irao. Securities and Exchange Commission Assistant Director Violeta Infante. And from the private sector, our friend Makati Business Club Executive Director Coco Alcuaz. Uh, we also have our friends from the media, Kapisana ng mga broadcaster ng Pilipinas, Executive Director Reynaldo Hulo. And from the academe, we have University of the Philippines Media and Public Relations Office, Vice President Elena Pernia, University of the Philippines Virata School of Business, Dean Joel Tan Torres, University of the Philippines Executive Director Victorino Souza, University of the Philippines Los Baños Director Jane Reyes, Polytechnic University of the Philippines Dean Guillermo Bungato, Dean Mina Comuyo, Dean Jocelyn Rivera Lutap, Dean Elmer De, De, De Jose, Dean Julieta Fonte, Associate Deans Mario Crescencio and Cindy Soliman, Directors Rialin Aranza and Angelina. Borican, Chairpersons Iris Rowena Bernardo, Blessing Glova, Josephine de la Isla, Hilda San Gabriel, Jerilyn um, Reyes, Bernadette Panibio, Marietta Duquenia, Ricardo Dizon, and Carmelita Mapano. And the PUP Open, is, uh, Open University Executive Director, Carmencita Castolo. And from the Development Academy of the Philippines Graduate School, Dean Lizan Cal, um, Kalina. And uh, we also have Southern Luzon State University Dean Marietta Villaverde, Tresi Marteres City College Dean Paul John Madrigal, Philippine Women's College of Davao Director Mercedita Hapay, Institute of Open and Distance Ex Education Director Ruth Marie Beth Bison, University of San Carlos Director Maxi Doreen Cabaron, St. Paul University Philippines Director Jesus Pizarro, Director Ros Rosalinda Tangilan, and Northern Iloilo Polytechnic State College, Batad Campus, Associate Director Eva Montero. And we also have with us this morning, Philippine Exporters Confederation, Assistant Vice President, Maria Fleur de Lisa Leong. Let me also greet our guests, colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS Facebook and SERP community Facebook pages. This public webinar was organized by the Institute Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, or what we call SERPI project, which has been in existence for more than 20 years. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by PIDS, other government agencies, academic and research institutions, and international organizations. It was established in the year 2000 to serve as a common link between the government and research institutions and provide an open access repository of socioeconomic information that policymakers, educators, and students can use. At present, the SERPI network consists of more than 50 partner institutions. Every two years, PIDS organizes a meeting to convene all the partner institutions and this is the network's sixth biennial meeting so far. The whole day event consists of two parts, a knowledge sharing seminar in the morning, which is open to the public, and the meeting proper in the afternoon, wherein the partner institutions will gather and look back at the last two years to see what we have um, um, done and also plan for ways forward. Um, I allow the PIDS SERPI team for choosing a very relevant theme for the SERPI biennial meeting and public webinar. Indeed, what we need today is less noise and more facts. By less noise, we mean less disinformation and misinformation, less fake news and more truth. I cannot overemphasize enough the importance of facts because at PIDS, it has always been our advocacy to promote the use of data and evidence in policy making. 
facts are what our policymakers need to make more informed and evidence-based decisions to craft relevant policies and programs that will address the most pressing needs of our country as we continue to battle this pandemic. It is also facts that we, the general public, need to perform our duty to our country in the most responsible and productive way possible. We cannot be responsible citizens if we are surrounded by false information and fake news that affect our thinking and behavior. We may not be able to distinguish truth from falsehood if we let disinformation and misinformation proliferate. Back in 2019, during the fifth annual public policy conference or APPC, this information was one of the topics that we highlighted in the APPC under the sub theme, building social cohesion and trust to emphasize the damaging effect of this information on our society. The proliferation of fake news in the social media undermines the integrity of our institutions and creates and exacerbates social and political divisions. Today's conversation focuses not only on why disinformation and misinformation happen, but also on how to combat fake news. And I'm delighted that our guests have accepted our invitation. We will hear from Professor Jason Cabanas of um, De La Salle University about how information is produced. His name may be familiar to most of you as he's one of the authors of the seminal publication, Architects of Network Disinformation, released a few years ago. Veteran journalist, esteemed academic, and co-founder of the media nonprofit Vera Files, Associate Professor Yvonne Chua, also graciously accepted our invitation to share her fact-checking initiatives. Ms. Gemma Mendoza, head of Rappler's Digital Strategy, will also share the initiatives of Rappler to fight fake news. Our very own Dr. Sheila Siar will discuss her take on the dangers of disinformation and misinformation in general, and in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. I wish to express my profound thanks to all our resource persons. Um, on July 31, I would retire from government service, and as this is my last public webinar as president of PIDS, I would like to thank all of you, the partners in government, academe and research, private sector, civil society, media and the public, for your continued support to PIDS, not just during my term as president, but throughout its, its existence. With your support and cooperation, we have been able to conduct numerous policy researches and disseminate this to our policymakers and other stakeholders to inform policy debates. I would also like to give special thanks to Dr. Sheila Siar and her team for spearheading the SERP initiative. Dr. Siar has worked very hard to expand the network so that the knowledge products of the partner institutions can be shared more effectively to the different stakeholders. In fact, we will be signing this afternoon a memorandum of understanding with NEDA Regional Office Mimaropa to extend the reach of the network to Region 4B. My successor, Dr. Aniceto Orbeta, will take the helm as PIDS President effective August 1. We will hear from him today when he officially closes this virtual event. I look forward to a productive discussion and everyone's active participation. Thank you and good morning. Thank you so much, Mamsel. So to get the ball rolling, let me introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker will talk about how to combat uh, disinformation and how to preserve the integrity of news and prevent the peddling of fake news in social media. She is the head for digital strategy at Rappler. She leads Rappler's evolution in content, data partnerships, and risk management on tech platforms, as well as its multi-pronged efforts to address disinformation and other critical concerns in digi digital media. Before joining Rappler, she served as online editor of Newsbreak, an award-winning investigative news group. She also served as editor-in-chief of ABS-CBN's news website, abscbnnews.com. Her stories, which are related to governance and um, corruption, the security sector disasters and other social issues have won awards and recognitions from various award-giving bodies, including the Jaime V. Ong Pin Awards for Investigative Journalism. She led uh, data journalism projects at Rappler, which have been recognized by the Data Journalism Awards. She also co-authored the book, The Enemy Within, published by Newsbreak in 2011. Friends, let us now give the floor to Ms. Gemma Mendoza. Ms. Gemma.
I hold on. I'm just sharing. Does everyone see my slides? Okay. Hi. Yes. I'm as as mentioned. Thank you so much, uh, Miss Taliping, and and to PIDS for inviting us. So I would I would like to share how. Uh, what are the efforts of Rappler uh, to to fight this information in the in digital media, and hoping that this will give others an idea on on what else can be done. So, first of all, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar, but we, we're familiar with Rappler as a news organization. But I want to make this um, uh, I explain this because this is um, th these are the pillars of Rappler, and this really like defines our approach to various. Um, social concern. So first, uh, of course, um, we are uh, we are professional journalists. Um, we believe in the power of uh, techno. We 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 used, uh, we believe in the power of uh, technology to amplify uh, solutions and to to scale up solutions. And at the same time, we really uh, one of the th uh, three pillars is community and civic engagement. Um, and and we work with we have a, a, a civic engagement team that directly works with advocates, with academe, and 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 uh, various sectors of society to in, to work on uh, solutions uh, to problems like environment, climate change, media and democracy, and governance. So those are some of the things that Raptor does. Um, um, when in, in relation to this information, we started out really with our fact-checking initiatives, which are a lot aligned with the the basic uh, uh, functions of a newsroom. Basically, as a newsroom, we we obviously like come across a lot of information, and part of um uh, part of the effort of reporting is double checking facts and verification. But um, moving into the twenty sixteen elections, we actively um fact check uh, claims uh, made by candidates, as well as even the we've done live fact checking of debates. Um, in the presidential debates during uh, moving into the 2016 elections, we've all uh, we've launched our when we, we we saw the rise of this information in cyberspace uh, around that time and um, in 2016 we um, we made uh, we launched the fact check uh, pro uh, the fact check uh, subsection uh, uh, of Rappler and um, eventually we became. Um, the, uh, a verified signatory of, of the International Fact Checking Network pointer, uh, the, the Code of Ethics, uh, since 2017. We also have since become one and continues to be uh, one of the third party fact check program partners of Rappler in the Philippines. Um, when the pandemic uh, 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 happened, uh, uh, we became part, we collaborated with global fact checkers in the Coronavirus Fact Check Alliance. Um, one of the things that we've really uh, done over the, we really ramped up in the past months uh, because of the um, like rise in false claims related to health, uh, this inf to to health information. Um, we became uh, um, we. We became a contributor to that. As I mentioned, we became a contributor to the uh, fact checking alliance, and um, the, the alliance has since spotted are almost uh, 10,000 10, and, and fact checked almost 10,000 claims in relation to COVID 19 and COVID 19 uh, uh, response. And and um, uh, as as mentioned, uh, as I mean, as everybody knows here, it became uh, it became a concern even for public health experts. Um, the, the World Health Organization and um, and UN actually called it the infodemic, uh, which has been which is seen as a um, a parallel uh, problem to the pandemic um, and is affecting pandemic response. Um, the other thing that we've done um, is to start looking at ways, better ways by which we can communicate our fact checks. So um, over the past months, we've started doing quite a lot, uh, converting our fact checks into video. Um, um, you can see this in YouTube. Um, we've done, we've been doing it in Taglish so that it can reach broader audiences. Um, and it's been doing well. We've done quite a, a, a dozens of these videos on, um, using the Yung Totoo, in the Yung Totoo um, ano to, video series on fact-checking. But apart from fact-checking, 
um, and, and, and fact checking really is one of the inputs to our broader research on the information ecosystem and and disinformation networks. We started looking at this more um, more systematically in 2016 when we we uh, observed uh, various fake uh, fake accounts that we proven to have been uh, to be fake. Um, on on Facebook, and um, we started automating data collection and investigating further these accounts, and we've seen that they have been um, they have been uh, like simulating. It's not just about the false claims, but what we are seeing here are what we call um, uh, they they really it's it's coordinated action. So that's something that we've been um, studying the inauthentic engagement. Uh, actors or and pages on social media that seem to be collaborating with each other um uh, in in a way that um makes it appear that there's an uh, there's a consensus so those are things that we we have been studying uh what else have been have we been doing so um since 2016 um the work uh, the work that we've done data collection on shark tank has resulted in has actually captured a significant amount of um, information that we've been um, sharing with uh, researchers um, here and uh, and abroad, so uh, academic researchers here and abroad, and and these are um, these now amount this database now amounts to like almost four hundred thousand public posts and comments online, um, produced by over sixty eight thousand pages and around twenty three thousand public groups. We've started looking at. Um, using these uh, channels as starting point, we've started uh, we've started analyzing links from YouTube and unearthed like something and have already looked at uh, roughly three hundred thousand uh, YouTube channels whose links were distributed within the pages and groups that we were monitoring. So that is input to the study um, that we hope uh, that that is something that we hope that will also not just be helping Rappler's efforts but also. Um, other academics that we work with um, to understand better the information ecosystem. Um, um, and, and part of that is uh, to, to also see like um, what are the uh, emerging dynamics. We've, we've been going over this closely. We watch this closely. Like who has the loudest share of voice? We tend to think it's the media, but um, not, not the case as the data shows here. Um, media has been um, the traditional media, mainstream media has largely been overwhelmed by a lot of content out there in cyberspace. And it's something that we've been closely monitoring. And, and that has been a contributing factor to the rise of false claim, to, to the rise of disinformation. Um, what else do we do? Um, apart from network analysis, like, like analyzing the actors, we've also looked at uh, meta narratives, like um, looking, it's a bit uh, it's pulling up, uh, uh, pulling up uh, from the individual claims to look at like the themes that are being discussed and to see how it impacts public discourse. So this is one of the things that we've been looking closely, and we've done a number of case reports already on this. Um, among those are um, investigations that um, into the network, into how network propaganda and these um, me meta narratives have been used to. Uh, for for um um for changing perceptions around um, martial law and you know, the Marcoses and and this is uh, this uh, investigation as you see here uh, started from the fact checks and look started looking at the data and looking at the um, the nuances the the themes that are being discussed um in the conversation in the public conversations and then um seeing impact also looking at what what that means for um for elections what that means for how people are perceiving pol certain politicians um a number of our um is investigations have seen uh, resulted in um like takedowns um for instance um our invest uh, an investigation that started in 2017 into um what initially was um like uh what was the um, what were the top uh, pages that were being uh, shared by one of the social influencers? 
sensors is um, has resulted in a in further investigation on a network that is uh, on on, on an, a company that was behind that network of pages and has since resulted in um takedown um in 2019 the, the biggest takedown ever in the philippines what else um we um our most recent um investigation um uh, uh this was on uh police sponsored pages that were um, that were disseminating this information um, and, and red tagging individuals in social media, um, uh, looked into the granular details and the networks and then has resulted in a takedown again of what, what eventually was unearthed to be um, uh, pages linked to the military. Um, finally, and, and um, beyond the, uh, no, beyond the, investigations though we've been work doing all um we've been sharing uh, um our our lessons from fact checking and and the uh, research through uh webinars and um webinars on fact checking on the fact checking methodology and um on on media and information literacy um after that we've done follow-ups there um, um in terms of um to 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 further deepen uh, the skills of people in fact checking through mentorship pro from through a member mentorship program and recently we launched a fellowship program for journalists here and in the region um and and the follow through there is really continuously engaging with this community there's a facebook group that we invite you to join it's a very active group of fact check of individuals uh, pe people who want, who are very much uh, passionate about fact checking um and um these are the numbers and we're really happy with how our fact check volunteers have since been producing and, and contributing fact checks on their own um beyond that we we have been working on like studying uh, disinformation patterns in uh, various platforms, Messenger, uh, YouTube, aside from Facebook, and have been uh, very active in the global uh, arena in calling the platforms to account for, for oversight uh, and for gaps in policies. So um, what else can be done? Um, it, we, we, it, this is something that we tell everybody um, at the end of every uh, webinar. We, we ask people to watch their use of digital media and beware of attempts to manipulate we we ask them to really uh, we teach them how to really learn we remind them to, to learn to detect dubious claims and fact check what they share we remind them to report abuse and dubious claims and help spread awareness and call out platforms uh, for inaction and abuse and it's really important this last one it's important for everybody to collaborate because it's really a very complex problem and it's something that uh, requires various uh, like complex solutions so that's all i have to share for now okay thank you so much for that very insightful uh, presentation miss mendoza so um uh we encourage everyone to just send their uh, questions on uh, the type on the chat box and we will entertain those uh, during the open forum so our next speaker is a uh, full professor in communication at the lasal, Uni at the LaSalle university he is uh, the chair of the ethnicity and race in communication division of the international communication association and also the associate uh, editor of the top tier journal communication culture and critic his primary research focus is on the med is on mediation of uh, cross-cultural intimacies and solidarities in popular culture and digital media, including the role of digital disinformation production on inter-Asian racism. This year, he has been named by the National Ac Academy of Science and Technology of the Philippines as one of the country's outstanding young scientists. To talk about work models of disinformation production, let us all welcome Dr. Jason Vincent Cabana, sir. Hello, good morning to uh, everyone. Uh, I think someone's going to help me with the slides, right? Thank you okay. very much. Right. Um, so I, I want to thank uh, PIDS for inviting me today uh, to share uh, the work that, uh, well, I've done with several colleagues uh, over, uh, I would say now around 
uh, five years or so on uh, disinformation production. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to begin by emphasizing that we need to understand that this information production particularly is contextual, okay, that the, uh, the, the context of the Philippines might share particular patterns with other things that are happening in the world, but it's also very distinct and we need to understand the particular contours of this information in our country. Because I would imagine many of you uh, would have already heard, for example, of the 50 cent army in, in China, or you might have heard about you know, the psychographic uh, uh, approaches of Cambridge Analytica in the US. And then you might have heard of these uh, young entrepreneurs in, in Macedonia uh, doing this information work too. So all of these are important to understanding the, the Philippine context, but we also need to pay attention to uh, what precisely is going on uh, here with us. Next slide, please. And I want to highlight a couple of points today as I uh, discuss uh, empirics a little later on. Uh, first of all, is that uh, together with Jonathan Ong and uh, other colleagues, we tried to approach uh, digital disinformation as a kind of cultural production. In some ways, it uh, complements uh, what uh, Gemma presented earlier. As a, it's a uh, different approach to understanding um, this information because what we do here is we look at the actual production process, the behind the scenes uh, of what happens in digital disinformation. Uh, this really started not, not as a project on digital disinformation, actually. I think it's, it's important to tell the origin story because uh, our research was really about um, digital labor in the Philippines. We were looking at uh, online freelancers and their working conditions and the kind of things that they do. And whilst doing interviews around that, uh, one of them told us that they also did uh, freelancing for political campaigns. And that's what got us uh, looking at digital disinformation. It was a bit of a uh, serendipity in a sense. Uh, and, and that's crucial to tell because really the kind of uh, disinformation production that we have in the Philippines, what, what makes it quite distinct is that a huge chunk of it uh, is anchored in the creative and digital industries. So it's really a hyper extension of the techniques that have been developed in ad and PR, uh, and also the kind of uh, work and thinking that, that predominates uh, our one of our sunshine industries, the digital industries, uh, and uh, using that uh, for digital disinformation. Um, I, I guess it's important to emphasize that uh, when I say that it's anchored in ad and PR, uh, that, that the people we eventually got to talk to who did this information uh, when we talked to them, they were no longer working uh, in, in ad and PR, but they came from there and they developed their expertise there. Some of them uh, were actually pretty big names uh, in, in the industry. Some of them had like a, a boutique PR, uh, local boutique PR uh, setups. So uh, like in, at the front, it would be like below the line campaigning, but they would also offer, uh, uh, you know, uh, the back door of uh, digital disinformation uh, kind of work. Um, and I, I think it's important as well to highlight that the reason why this is the kind of digital disinformation that uh, we have in the Philippines is because of uh, the kind of politics that we have, which is very uh, image oriented, very weak uh, political parties. So it's really all about branding. And so you begin to see the importance of, of ad and PR. If you're trying to brand politicians, you're trying to brand particular political causes and, and policies, and uh, the, the role of this kind of work in, in amplifying particular perspectives uh, about these different things. Um, eventually, we, uh, over time, doing work on this information, we kind of uh, saw as well that uh, there, there is actually a range of uh, digital disinformation work models that are out there. Uh, and in, in our newer work, the politics and profit in uh, the big news factory, we, we outline these different models. Some that are uh, much more politically driven and some are more uh, profit driven and some are a bit of a mix uh, of both. And what I want to emphasize today actually are those that are 
that lean more towards uh, the profit-driven kinds of digital disinformation production, uh, primarily because uh, they're the ones that are very savvy at this. Uh, those that are uh, more politically driven, you can ask me about them later, uh, like uh, they are, for example, uh, in, in, in particular, uh, you know, LGUs, uh, some, some politicians there would ask their, their staff members to do uh, uh, trolling on the sideline for, uh, against their opponents, etc. Uh, so that exists, but it tends to be clumsily done. But, but the one that's coming out of the creative and digital industries, those are the ones that are really well done and, and, and that we really have to contend with uh, because of how professionally, uh, uh, you know, how much they've been strategized and, and implemented uh, in, a, in a systematic kind of uh, way. So this is really rapidly diversifying. Uh, uh, I think it's important to note that uh, what, whatever I talk about here are not the only work models out there. Uh, for us academics, it's very, very hard to track because it's rapidly moving along. And, and so we're just giving an indication of how many they can be. And there might be other things there that we haven't seen yet. So if you want to read up a bit more on this, uh, there are QR codes that are down there uh, on the screen. You might uh, want to scan them and they should lead you to the uh, you know, free downloads of uh, the architects of networks information and uh, politics and profit in the fake news uh, factory. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. The other point I wanted to emphasize as I go through the empirics today uh, comes from my more recent work uh, that digital disinformation needs to be understood not just as information, but also as connected to our imagination. Okay, so uh, facts really do matter. Uh, and I think we'll have a lot of discussion around that today. Uh, but, but from what I'm seeing on the ground, this information is not just about clear cut truths and lies, but it's really about uh, how these dis digital disinformation producers couch their claims uh, in particular social narratives. Uh, and then they're experts at kind of getting the pulse of what these social narratives are that people are concerned with and kind of connecting digital disinformation content to these social narratives. And it's really what makes uh, the content that they do powerful is this ability to connect to these uh, so-called uh, deep stories. Uh, it's, it's a term from uh, the sociologist Arlie Hochschild, and it's, it speaks to our uh, shared narratives as a society uh, those that we subscribe to that really heavily shape uh, not just how we view the political world, but, but how we act uh, in it. Um, so I'm doing uh, empirical work on this at the moment. Uh, the, the theoretical approach I've outlined uh, in, in uh, one of my papers, recent papers, you can again download that using the QR code that you're seeing there. But uh, this week I'm actually, my deadline is on Saturday, I'm trying to put together uh, the, the, my write up on the empirics of this, how this actually happens, how people engage with these, uh, what, what are the deep stories that Filipinos have in terms of uh, their view of politics and how are these connecting to certain digital disinformation uh, campaigns and why these campaigns might be resonant or not uh, with, with people. So I think it's important to, to remember this. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, the two models that I want to talk about today uh, is the add and PR model, and uh, the other one is the uh, clickbait model. Okay, so let's begin with this uh, add and PR model, which is a bit of a mix of, of politics and profit, but leaning more towards uh, profit. Next slide, please. So what we found, what my research team and I have found, is that uh, with, with the add and PR model, what we have is a, a ne network hierarchy. Okay, so it's a, a loosely affiliated group of individuals who work on a campaign to campaign basis. Okay? And uh, sometimes they don't even know each other necessarily, apart from the people up, up the top who are uh, leading this whole thing. Okay? And of course, that's a strategic move as well. Uh, but, but there is a hierarchy, even though they're loosely networked. 
And uh, at the top of at the top of this hierarchy, what we found are uh, what we call the chief architects of network disinformation. So these are uh, ad and PR executives, and their role is to recruit and lead disinformation teams. And uh, beyond that, they're the ones who are experts, like I mentioned earlier, at identifying what the deep stories of people are and crafting campaigns that connect to these particular deep stories. So they're really very, very good with conceptualization. And uh, in our conversations with them, what they said is that the reason why they're doing, uh, well, part of the reason that they're doing digital disinformation um, is that they're experienced, they're already very experienced, and they're bored by, by corporate marketing. They've made brands number one. They've made celebrities trend. They want to see if they can apply these techniques to politics as well. And they see themselves as the pioneers of this new digital frontier. And they're, uh, well, at, at the end of the 2016 elections, they were in combat with the traditional political campaign operators because they want to supplant them. Uh, they, 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 they're saying that they're the new version of uh, 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 political communicators who are much more uh, uh, digitally savvy. So when we ask them, we, we have this what we call, how do you sleep at night question, uh, the, the moral justifications uh, for what they do. Uh, what they say is that it's, uh, well, one of the techniques they use to distance themselves from the work that they do is fictionalization. Uh, they talk about the work that they do uh, primarily in terms of popular culture. Okay, so one of them would say that uh, she feels that she's like Olena Tyrell, uh, you know, uh, uh, strategizing this, this Game of Thrones kind of uh, war. Uh, another of the chief architects said that she's uh, Olivia Pope and that she is the scandal. So, you know, that's how they talk about uh, the work that they do. Um, the other one is through experimentation. They don't think of what they're doing as something that undermines democracy, but instead they think of you know, what they're doing as a puzzle to be solved. There's a politician with a bad name. How do we make sure that people learn to like this politician again? There's this policy that's very unpopular. How do we make this popular? So it's not necessarily about is it good or bad, but how can we solve the problem that uh, we have at hand? Next slide, please. Uh, at the middle level of this uh, network hierarchy, are uh, what we call the uh, anonymous digital influencers. So these are, uh, the main role that they have is a translation work. So a lot of them uh, go into digital disinformation as a part-time kind of thing. They're mostly in digital marketing, search engine optimization, et cetera. Uh, so that's their expertise. And their main role is to translate the concept of the chief architects into the language of ordinary Filipinos so that it really connects with the people. Uh, so they're, they're anonymous. They have many different accounts, different avatars that actually have brand Bibles. They have different personalities. So uh, uh, there are some that are more positive, some are more attack and negative that, that's used to discredit uh, political opponents, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, when we were doing this work in 2016, 2017, uh, the requirement was to have social media accounts numbering from 50,000 to 2 million. But that's changed, I think, because now their focus is in more uh, micro manipulation. You don't really need to have big numbers anymore. What you need is access to WhatsApp groups, Viber groups, Facebook groups. So when we ask these uh, digital influencers why they do this information, their responses were about normali normalization and financial security. Normalization uh, meaning you know, everyone already does this kind of fudging of the truth. That's what we do in ad and PR. We fudge the truth a little bit. So what's the harm of doing the exact same thing for politics? So they, they think that in the media and creative industries and the digital industries, fudging the truth is what people tend to do. So there's really not anything wrong with that if you try to do it in politics as well, which is, of course, not necessarily true because of the impacts these things have on our democracy. Uh, the other one is on a financial security that uh, a lot of these people are what we would call precarious middle class. They have, a, they have an okay salary, but they want a, a more of a taste of a middle class lifestyle. Uh, and the chief architects know this. They feed this desire for a real middle class lifestyle. Uh, and in fact, in some disinformation campaigns, they, the chief architects would, would reserve the penthouse of a five-star hotel and Billet the anonymous influencers there for a few days. Make this 
same trend, make it number one on Twitter. Uh, and then whilst you're doing that, you get free drinks, free flowing drinks and food. And then the person who gets the highest engagement, the highest reactions, likes, shares, etc., might get a free iPhone or a free iPad or, or a MacBook or something like that. So a taste of that middle class lifestyle. Uh, and uh, uh, next slide, please. There. And then at the bottom of this hierarchy are the community level uh, fake account operators. So these are people who do, uh, you know, these are the people that, that I guess we see uh, and we fight with on, on the comment section. The, they do the script based work, copy paste, and create uh, the illusion of engagement. Their role is to amplify uh, what the digital influencers have put out there. And uh, their moral justifications are primarily about career and financial insecurity. We haven't really, we weren't able to see the actual uh, place where they're working. Uh, I think this is what people imagine when they think of trolls, like the factory light setting. We, we weren't able to see that because a lot of them in, are situated in the bailiwicks of politicians, so it's hard to negotiate access. But we got to talk to some of them, and a lot of them are actually like college students needing money for tuition. Uh, and as they were saying, quote unquote, kapit sa patali. So we actually assign the least blame to these community level fake account operators who just find themselves needing to do uh, this kind of uh, work. Next slide, please. Um, and then here, just to note that uh, most of the engagement that you see in digital media uh, is actually true. And, and the role of the, in the, the, the architecture of network disinformation is to mobilize these people to, uh, to tap into the fans' enthusiastic seal for, for support. Uh, and, and that's why they say they only use 20% bots and the rest of it is actual engagement because that's what they want to happen for people to actually contribute to this. So these are the unpaid uh, actual people further amplifying the, the disinformation content. Next, please. Uh, maybe we can talk about this a little later on if we have time in, in the Q&A, but the point here is to say that uh, there is a movement from campaign design to campaign implementation. And whilst the design uh, process might feel very professional, it's, it's in the implementation where it becomes very toxic, vitriolic, because you want to be as viral uh, as possible and as effective as possible. So that's where uh, really the misogynistic, racist, uh, all these different things come in. It's in the implementation of the campaigns. And the anonymous digital influencers translate the work and uh, that's amplified by the uh, community level fake account operators. Next, please. And then very briefly, I want to talk about the clickbait model. Uh, and this is really the most profit driven of them all uh, in the sense that uh, it's really technopreneurs uh, trying to see what is the most viral content, what will get them the most engagement and therefore the most revenue online. And I think this is actually very relevant for health disinformation. This, some people might ask, why do people do health disinfo? And it's precisely because of this, they earn money from this viral kind of content uh, that, that, that's reliant on algorithms, determining people's deep stories via algorithms. Next, please. And what's, what's really problematic here is usually the kind of content that people engage with are very pernicious. And so these are the ones that the algorithms also tend to push forward. Those that are racist, misogynist, toxic, vitriolic, etc., uh, across the political spectrum and even with health disinformation. So it, it has, uh, it, it tends to surface really the most problematic content because of the, this, this profit motive uh, that they have. Next, please. And uh, this kind of disinformation has many effects from historical distortion, which is kind of is important now that we're nearing elections, um, but also the things like anti-minority and anti-migrant racism, uh, things that are related to COVID-19. For example, this information that, that connects COVID-19 with the arrival of the recent influx of uh, Chinese nationals in, in, in Metro Manila and the rest of the, uh, the Philippines. Uh, so, so all of this very problematic uh, after effects. Next, please. Uh, and so uh, finally, I just wanted to say, and maybe we can discuss this in uh, greater detail a little later on, uh, that there are particular trends in uh, digital disinformation that we need to pay attention to. 
uh, the democratization of this information, meaning how it's spreading across different kinds of campaigns, not just one group doing this, but almost everyone in on it. The proliferation of digital underground work that's, that's premised on the very precarious situation of many of our digital workers. The increasing centrality of micromedia manipulation, which is harder to see uh, because it's in WhatsApp and Facebook groups and et cetera. But also the emergence of new social narratives anchored on people's deep stories, which gives us hope that maybe we can push back at the, the current disinformation content because we can create counter disinformation content that, that connects with these new uh, narratives. So I, I wanna end by saying that digital disinformation is not a technological problem only, it is a social problem, very much so. And so the solution is also social. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you so much for that very interesting uh, presentation, Dr. Cabanes. I think we are ready to listen to our third speaker. Okay, so she is an associate professor of journalism at the University of the Philippines, a longtime journalist. She co-founded the media nonprofit Vera Files, where she started and led uh, various editorial projects from 2008 to early 2019, including Vera Files Fact Check. She coordinated Check.ph, a pioneering collaborative uh, fact-checking initiative for the 2019 Philippines election. Um, and in, she also initiated and supervises fact rakers for her students' fact checks. She is also a member of the uh, Commission on Higher Education's Technical Committee on Journalism. Friends, let us all welcome Associate uh, Professor Yvonne Chua, ma'am. The floor is now yours. Maraming salamat at magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. <clears throat> let me just uh, share my screen. Wanting patience lang po. <laughs> Okay, can you see my screen? Can you confirm? Uh, wala pa po yung screen, ma'am. There, there you go. Okay. Okay. Just set it up. Okay. Um, again, magandang umaga sa inyong lahat at marami pong salamat sa Sir P sa imbitasyon sa inyong pagpupulo ngayong umaga. Um, I have been asked to share my professional and personal initiatives to combat disinformation, as well as some insights on how to improve information dissemination in the Philippines for a better normal. Specifically, ang focus ko raw ay um, <coughs> fact checking in the age of digital information. Uh, digital, <coughs> sorry, uh, fact checking in the I know, ad an academics initiative. But in addition to what Gemma and Jason have already shared, I want to throw in a few more pieces of information about the current state of disinformation in our country. For us to better understand why a whole of society approach is urgently needed to beat back disinformation and why fact checking is just one of the many strategies to do that. We have had a number of reports that provide insights on the state of disinformation in the Philippines, among others, like Jason mentioned, disinformation players, such as the architects and the networks that they mobilize, uh, like men uh, Gemma mentioned, the people and claims that have been fact-checked, the false accounts that social media platforms have, been ta have taken down, the recruitment to government of influencers who manufacture or distribute false or misleading information, and, uh, and a lot more. But I've been asking myself this for some time now, just how widespread really is this information in the Philippines? Uh, what do the numbers say? The Digital News Report is the yearly global study on news consumption by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, a research center of Oxford University. In its online survey early this year, 19,000 more adult plus um, adult respondents in 46 media markets, including Roughly 2,000 from the Philippines were asked if they had seen in the past week false or misleading information on any of the eight topics that were listed. Disclosure, I'm I'm a partner, a Philippine partner for the study and thought I'd extract the, ans the answer from the data set for this morning's event because you don't find that answer in the report. The survey actually shows that only 4% of Filipino respondents said that they had not encountered false or misleading information. And 7% were not sure, di raw nila alam. This leaves us with at least 89% or nine in 
nine in ten Filipinos who had been exposed to this information. Nakakabahala. I believe with, uh, you'll agree with me that 89% is not just high, but it is extremely high, especially when we compare the Philippines to 45 other media markets covered by the digital news report this year. The global average in orange stands at 73%. At 89%, itong pula, the Philippines rank second in self-reported exposure to disinformation after Peru, with just one percentage point difference. Broken down into topics, Filipinos said they have seen more false or misleading information about, of course, the COVID-19 than the other topics at the time of the survey. This is pretty much a no-brainer given uh, the pandemic that we are in uh, at the moment or have been since last year. It should also be of little surprise if we have many Filipinos saying they have been exposed to false or misleading information related to politics around 57%, or to celebrities for that matter, about 48%. Fact checks by local institutions such as Rappler and Verifiles bear this out. But what makes the Philippines distinct in this report is the unusually big proportion of respondents that said that they have been exposed to misinformation about celebrities. The average for the Philippines is, like I said, 48%. It is more than one and a half times the global average of 29%. Marami kasing mga artista at celebrities na pinapatay natin online. I'm sure you can name a few. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't recall coming across any recent survey among Filipinos about really the sources of disinformation. So the answer to this question in last year's and this year's digital news report is of great interest to me. The question last year applied to topics, meaning which of the following, if any, are you most concerned about online? This year's question pertains only to the coronavirus. Now, regardless of whether it's about all the topics or just COVID-19, when it comes to spreading misinformation, we find that the highest level of concern is about the behavior of politicians, followed by ordinary citizens. And when it comes to channels through which COVID-19 misinformation spreads online, parang no-brainer na to, eh, ba? There is most concern among Filipinos about Facebook, that's 50%, followed by news websites and messaging apps such as uh, Facebook Messenger. Then below a tenth would say YouTube search engines like Google and, of course, Twitter. As I mentioned, no-brainer if Facebook should emerge as a top answer because 97% or nearly 97% of Filipinos ages 16 to 64 use Facebook according to We Are Social. Now, this for me is cause for concern. And I draw these findings from another study that I was part of. They're based on an online survey commissioned by the media nonprofit Internews. Um, this surveyed more than 19,000 Filipinos nationwide in sometime in May last year. Like I said, this is a cause for concern for me, you know, because despite knowing the presence of disinformation, especially online, we still have 7% of Filipinos who say they never verify the news or information that they consume. Only a third have developed the habit of always verifying news or information. Um, in the same study, the interview study, note that the very young and the very old are the least likely to verify news or information that they obtain. 13% for the 14 to 17 year olds and 14% for uh, the tenders. The younger respondents from 17, uh, I'm sorry, from 14 to 24 or our Gen Z are also less likely to always verify news or information compared with the rest. What keeps them from verifying news or information? On the whole, Filipinos cited the lack of time, but the lack of know-how, I don't know how to do it, is also behind the failure or inability of one in five Filipinos to do so. This self-confessed gap in knowledge and skills cuts across all age groups and certainly needs to be addressed. These findings underscore the need to equip Filipinos with verification or fact-checking skills, both inside and outside the classroom. Allow me to just share some of my work as a journalism educator educator in the classroom because it 
um, I can talk about what I've done outside the classroom um, in the open forum. Journalism is committed to truth seeking and truth telling. It is what we journalists say, a discipline of verification. This makes fact checking an essential component in journalism and correspondingly in journalism education. But you know, the concept of fact checking in journalism has really evolved since a century ago when newsrooms first hired fact checkers. The classical notion of fact checking in newsrooms back then, and sadly, even among some newsrooms today, is the work undertaken by an editorial person. Think of a copy editor or a researcher who comes through a reporter's copy or story to ensure factual and contextual accuracy. Until a few years ago, a considerable number of journalists and journalism educators in the country thought of fact checking in that way. With the escalation of disinformation, however, the fact checking we now refer to has evolved or expanded to include verifying and, if necessary, debunking textual and visual claims, including lies, before they are published or broadcast. These are made by individuals, groups, or institutions ranging from our public officials and figures to netizens who produce user-generated content. The fact-checking we practice today in this digital era is more complicated and sophisticated, as you've seen in Gemma's presentation a while ago. It necessitates a plethora of research knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques. Bearing this in mind, I've been updating the journalism courses I've been, I've been teaching over the past decade to introduce this modern variant of fact-checking. In the journalism curriculum, there are at least two pathways or strategies. One, of course, is to incorporate fact checking or verification to an existing course. The other is to create a separate full semester or trimester course. I've done both. I initially integrated fact checking to the existing course I was handling, journalism ethics, or what we call J110 at UP Dileman. Years later, I developed the syllabus for a semester long fact checking course to be offered as a seminar uh, for or what we call J196. Both these courses are required in our journalism program at UP. So how long have my students been learning fact checking as a concept, as a skill, or as both a concept and skill? In 2011, a couple of years after PolitiFact in Florida won the Pulitzer Prize of fact checking in the 2008 American elections, students in my stu uh, journalism ethics class began examining what was back then an emerging form or genre of journalism. We now call it fact-checking journalism. This was uncharted waters for us, but examining PolitiFact's mission and methodology certainly deepened our understanding and appreciation of the journalistic principles of truth-telling and stewardship, and stewardship and of the necessity of accuracy and verification. While we discussed the contemporary of uh, the contemporary concept of fact checking in the initial years, we did not as yet venture into political fact checking at, as an activity. What you're seeing here is uh, on your screen is one of the slides from what I used in, way back in 2011. In 2014, Canadian journalist Craig Silverman released his seminal book, Verification Handbook, which raised the urgency of verifying digital content, especially UGC, during emergency coverage such as disasters and conflicts. A year later, our journalism ethics class began applying these novel verification techniques and strategies to UGC or user-generated content. On your right, you'll see the guide for the verification assignment each student had to execute back in 2015. It required them to perform reverse image search, photo forensics, geolocation, and source backgrounding, among others. 2016 was an interesting year for us. If you recall, the Commission on Elections had organized the first presidential debate for the elections in February that year, and several news outlets decided to fact check the candidate's statement. In our journalism ethics class, however, my students asked if we could do it as well and do do more. We then agreed to fact check not only the presidential candidates and not only the televised debates, as most newsrooms were doing. Instead, we included the vice presidential and senatorial candidates. We went beyond televised debates and covered forums in schools, television, radio interviews, speeches in campaign sorties. We fact checked on a weekly basis. I was still a trustee and editor of the media nonprofit Verifiles at the time. So, of course, I managed to create an election microsite called Is That So to host the student's fact check. I vetted the pieces with the help of a colleague who is now a fact check editor of Agence France Press, and nearly all the fact checks published in that 
uh, and is that so, were produced by students, attesting to the quality output that our students can turn out. Following the 2016 elections, is that so morphed into Verifals Fact Check, which is now run by professional fact checkers. I had worked out a grant from an American profit non an American nonprofit, which kickstarted the operations of Verifals Fact Check. Not long after, Verifals Fact Check became a verified signatory of the International Fact Checking Network at Pointer, which has been setting standards for fair, transparent, uh, and accountable fact checking. This in turn paved the way for Verifals Fact Check to become a third party fact checker of Facebook in the Philippines. And the rest, as they say, is history. The student successful foray into fact checking during the 2016 election led me to another experiment. In 2017, the department approved my proposal to include fact checking among the topics for our journalism seminar course or J196. This slideshow, this slide, I mean, shows what the semester long covers. The semester long course covers. It is not restricted to fact checking. More than a third of the semester is spent on deepening our understanding of disinformation and other types of information disorder in the Philippines and elsewhere. This prepares us not only for the task of verifying, verifying textual and visual lies, but also explore other strategies to better respond to disinformation. In the process, students obtain a better handle of fact checking as well as one of the elements that should be part of a multi-pronged strategy to push back against disinformation. The class ran like a news production course, complete with a detailed workflow. But because of the pandemic, we have had to cut out some of the stages. Research is an important component of the course. We adopted the framework assembled by Wardell and Direction in the study of disinformation. False or misleading information was not, does not only fact-checked for its veracity, but deconstructed or broken down according to its elements, agents, uh, agent, message, and interpreter, and their sub-elements. As well, students examined the flow of this information from the creator, producer, and distributor. By going through the process, students are reminded that fact-checking, while very important, doesn't end when they have rated a statement or image as fabricated or manipulated. They need to dig deeper and hope to unmask the bad actors, their network, their modus operandi, their distribution channel, motives, targets, and the harm that they cause. As in any journalism course, the fact-checking course strives to make learning as practical and real-world as possible. So in 2018, we tied up with our college publication to fact-check the university student council elections. Just like 2016, 2019 provided students an opportunity to fact-check a real-world event, the midterm elections. The UP system, through the Department of Journalism, took the lead in cobbling together the first collaborative fact-checking initiative in the country. It managed to bring together three universities, UP, La Salle, and Ateneo, and 11 newsrooms, including Rapper, to fact-check the elections. A shout-out to Dr. Pernia, if she's still around. Dr. Pernia was the dean of the College of Mass Communication when we were hatching this initiative. She was instrumental in turning this into a UP system initiative. Um, in November, months after the 2019 elections, my students and I began building the fact-checking website and social media account called Fact Rakers to host our fact checks. It is a takeoff from the term muckrakers. When the pandemic struck in early January and the quarantine was imposed in the country, fact checkers, fact rakers, I'm sorry, began debunking COVID-19 misinformation alongside other fact checkers. Let me just move into this one, disinformation studies or disinformation research that I've been involved in. It might be of interest to you. Uh, disinformation, Studies is an emerging research field, not only in journalism, but in many other fields, such as political science, ecology, and data science. Um, I've already mentioned the Digital News Report 2021 that I was part of. Besides the questions that were shown earlier, the survey also looked into the degree to which uh, respondents were concerned about what is real and what is fake on the internet. The internews study I mentioned earlier is contained in the publication Information Dystopia and Philippine Democracy, which I co-authored with Nicole Curato and Jonathan Ong. The survey, like I said, called 19,000 respondents. But what might be of interest to you is it had gone out of its way to draw respondents from all 
the regions, the 17 regions. This allows us to come up, to come up with a more nuanced approach to fighting disinformation. A few disinformation related studies I've done followed the trail of fact checks on the 2019 elections and on the coronavirus. You'll see similar studies that use fact checks as their source of data because they serve as a good uh, starting point for disinformation research. Mediacy or recency is one of their strengths. Researchers who want to depict the prevailing disinformation landscape in the shortest possible time rely in part on fact checks as we've been seen on the COVID-19 misinformation. Fact checks also conform to the standards that are generally making them generally re reliable. And they can also lead us to disinformation players and networks as Gemma has shown. Skip this. I'd just like to end by saying that earlier I mentioned how a whole of society approach is needed to beat back disinformation and fact checking as one of the multiple strategies that need to be put in place. Like other initiatives, fact checking plays an important role in this fast paced digital world that has allowed disinformation to spread fast and to flourish. Because they are evidence based, fact checks certainly weaken the basis on which disinformation is grounded. It is by far one of the fastest responses to exposing disinformation. It helps fills, it helps fill, I'm sorry, the data voids that arise when available relevant data uh, when available relevant data online is still limited, non-existent, or deeply problematic. Existing research has also shown that fact checks indeed increase knowledge of accurate information, although not necessarily alter or modify beliefs. From my experience, fact checking can be taught both in and out of the classroom, and, and it certainly has helped develop critical thinking. Hence, the growing support for fact checking and why this support should continue. Maraming salamat po. Okay, so maraming salamat, uh, Professor Yvonne, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation. And now we are uh, down to our last speaker. Okay, um, our last speaker will discuss the motivations of people in sharing false information as well as the impact of fake news on the pandemic, among others. She leads the Knowledge Dissemination Program of PIDs which includes the Institute's publications, seminars, and events, online and social media, and knowledge databases, particularly the Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, or the SERPI. She has a PhD in Development Studies from the University of Auckland in New Zealand, and a Master of Arts in Public Administration from the International Christian University in Tokyo, Japan. Prior to PEDS, she worked at a number of international organizations, including the International Institute for for Rural Reconstruction, International Rice Research Institute, and International Center for Living Aquatic Resources Management. Friends, I now turn over the floor to Dr. Sheila Sharmi. Sheila. Good day. So let me begin by uh, clarifying that although the title of my presentation is about fake news and how it has worsened the pandemic, I will be mentioning equally important concepts, ideas, and findings from the literature about fake news in general. So let us distinguish uh, misinformation from uh, disinformation, which are two different uh, concepts. So misinformation is when someone might unintentionally spread fake news Yet the person is not aware that such information is false. This information, on the other hand, is the deliberate act of creating or disseminating false information to cause harm. And according to experts, the producers of this information typically have political, financial, psychological, or social motivations. So why would people believe in fake news? Cognitive psychology and behavioral research offer some explanations on why people would fall for fake news even though it is false. And I compiled the most popular and relevant ones available in the literature. So uh, to illustrate the um, the illusory, uh, illusory truth effect says that um, our in exposure and re-exposure to misinformation tend to make us believe that it is real. Meanwhile, the familiarity 
effect, on the other hand, says that uh, we are more likely to believe information that we are most familiar with. Okay, how about the source effect? Sinasabi naman ng source effect na uh, naniniwala tayo sa information provided by those whom we perceive as credible. How about the ideology effect? Well, it simply says that uh, we tend to believe um, something that uh, that is aligned with our ideological uh, predisposition. Okay, and um, related to that is the con uh, confirmation bias, which says that we seek or interpret evidence that are aligned with our beliefs and values. And the primary effect, on the other hand, says that um, we tend to form conclusive opinions as a result of information that we first acquired. There's also what is called as the delusion effect, and it simply says that delusion-prone individuals are more likely to accept fake news because they have a low tendency to engage in analytic thinking. Dogma or religion um, effect simply says that um, dogmatic uh, individuals and religious fundamentalists are more likely to believe in fake news. Also, according to research, people who tend to uh, believe in fake news are those who lack reflective uh, reasoning or analytical thinking. Bullshit. There's also what is called as bullshit receptivity, and pardon, pardon me for using the B word. Bullshit receptivity refers to uh, not having regard for for truth. So, walang pake alam kung tama man o mali yung information. So, and it's and this theory says that people who have no concern for truth are more more likely to believe in fake news. There's also the um overclaiming a uh, theory. Overclaiming meaning uh, mahilig pagbuhat ng mangko, uh, mahilig magpa, magpa, kitang gilas. And, and this theory says that um, people who uh, have a tendency to uh, self-enhance when asked about uh, their familiarity with general knowledge have a tendency to believe in fake news. Okay, so from believing in false information, let us go to the sharing part. Is it always intentional? Okay, so the answer is no. Sharing of fake information... Uh, does not necessarily imply belief and a person may be sharing false information unintentionally okay so why would people share fake news again we can draw insights from uh, cognitive psychology uh, it may be the result of or it may be the effect of bullshit receptivity uh, which i have uh, explained earlier bullshit receptivity meaning the lack of regard for truth i don't care if it is true or not attitude it can also be a case of virtue signaling or purposely trying to uh, promote oneself or uh, demonstrate one's good character. Or the person uh, really wants to inflict harm or damage on another, on another person. A study by Shalin Talwar and colleagues also found that those with high trust in um, the content in social media, those who do not hesitate to reveal themselves, or to reveal um, information about themselves in social media. And those who have the FOMO attitude, FOMO meaning a fear of missing out, ayaw magpahuli, gusto lagi active sa social media, are more likely to share uh, fake news. Also, people who experience a social uh, media fatigue are also more likely to share fake news news as a quick way to remain socially active virtually without putting in much effort. Also, a 2021 study by Apuke and Omar found other predictors of fake news sharing on COVID-19. So, these predictors include altruism or the desire to help others. And related to this is the second predictor, which is the desire to share information. Other factors that they found were socialization or the desire to uh, build and keep social uh, connections, which, as we all know, has heightened during this pandemic due to lack of face-to-face uh, -face interaction. Also, uh, the desire to seek information and to pass time. So is fake news a recent phenomenon? Obviously not. Fake news existed even in the olden times. It's as old as mankind, but what makes fake news different now is the ease by which it is produced, spread, and multiplied, given the tools of modern communication, particularly uh, social media. As we all know, with social media, it is easy to uh, disseminate information to a mass audience, and it's also easy to access information. Social media is also driven by the so-called attention economy. You might have heard of this term, attention economy, whereby the human attention is treated as a scarce commodity in the internet. Um, the human mind is exposed to a considerable amount of information online. Hence, to capture one's attention and hold it, the message should be meaningful, 
and significant to the audience. So it's not about whether the information is true or not. It's about whether it holds meaning to the audience. And earlier, I mentioned the different ways by which the human mind may perceive a message and consider it as truth, even though it is false information. Okay. Um, and finally, the ubiquity and accessibility of social media makes it a viable channel in spreading fake news. So just to show the pervasiveness of the internet and social media, in 2020, as you can see on the screen, out of a total global population of 7.75 uh, billion, 49% are active uh, social media users, 59% have access to the internet, and 67% have access to a mobile phone. Okay, in Southeast Asia, the Philippines is one of the highest internet and social media penetration rates at 67%. We may not be the highest, but in terms of time spent on the internet and social media, Filipinos spend the longest hours online. So how has fake news affected the pandemic? In February 2020, the WHO Director General noted that the world is fighting not just a pandemic but also an infodemic as fake news is spreading faster than COVID-19. But what is infodemic? It's a blend of two words, uh, information and epidemic. And uh, based on uh, the definition uh, given by the WHO, it refers to the overabundance of information some accurate and some not that makes it difficult for people to find trustworthy sources and re reliable guidance when they need it. So based on false information monitored by the International Fact-Checking Network or IFCN, which is an entity under the Journalism Research Organization Pointer Institute, Dang um, and his colleagues classify the content of fake news about COVID-19 that circulated in um, several Southeast um, Asian uh, countries as of May uh, 5, 2020. And they found out that the majority of false information in COVID-19 that circulated in uh, the Philippines, uh, in Thailand, and in Myanmar were about the symptoms, diagnosis, prevention, and treatment measures uh, on COVID. And these comprised um, 32 to um, 46% of the fake news detected by IFCN in these countries. In contrast, the topmost uh, content in Indonesia was political, religious, and ethnic uh, targeted fake news. False information related to government's action and regulation was the second most prevalent fake news monitored in the four Southeast Asian countries with the addition of false and misleading statistics in Thailand. So this slide uh, shows some examples of misinformation that proliferated during the pandemic. All of these may sound familiar to you. So um, on the screen are some um, fake news related to prevention or cure against COVID-19, such as uh, drinking of drinking bleach or alcohol, alcohol um, eating ginger uh, and gargling uh, with warm uh, salt water. Okay, so this one here, uh, is about the nature of COVID-19 and some conspira conspiracy theories, some, with, some of which we hear until now. Okay, And this one here are examples of misinformation about the side effects of vaccine and their efficacy. Okay. So just last Saturday, the New York Times uh, ran an article about a doctor in the United States by the name of Joseph Marcola touted as the most influential spreader of coronavirus misinformation online. And according to the New York Times, uh, uh, Mercola's online article on February 9, 2021, declared that coronavirus vaccines were a medical fraud, that infections do not prevent infections, and that COVID shots alter one's genetic coding. Anti-vaccination uh, activists or anti-vaxxers easily picked up these claims and the said article was translated from English into Spanish and Polish and reached 400,000 uh, people on Facebook. It's not easy to quantify the impact of fake news on COVID, but one thing is for sure, the effects of false information are far and wide. Um, it can expose individuals and uh, communities to further uh, risk um, from not following the health protocols and from not getting vaccinated. It can also instigate a uh, public fear, um, 
public panic, uh, anxiety, creating a host of mental uh, health issues. We've also seen how hate speech and anti-ethnic sentiments against Asians and Muslims linking them to a COVID-19 have stimulated racial tensions and fueled um, xenophobic violence and discrimination. We have, all, we, have, we have heard of the harm inflicted by racial attacks against Asians in the U.S. Last year, when we hardly know about COVID-19, there were so many false information circulating about prevention and treatment measures. And we heard uh, news about people getting hospitalized from drinking bleach or rubbing alcohol. You may have also heard of the sudden spike in the price of ginger last year when news circulated that it can prevent COVID-19. In India, the meat traders, uh, particularly poultry producers and sellers, were seriously affected by false claims that circulated in April last year that eating vegetarian food and eliminating meat from the diet can prevent one from getting COVID-19. According to Indian authorities, this misinformation contributed to losses of up to 130 billion rupees or $1.8 billion to India's poultry industry. Fake news about um, government uh, uh, regulations such as the imposition of a lockdown have also um, caused uh, unnecessary hoarding and panic buying. These are just some of the impacts of fake news about COVID-19. I'm sure you have more to add to this slide. Speaking of figures, a pre-pandemic study by the University of Baltimore and Czech, which is an in, uh, Israel-based cybersecurity firm, estimated the economic cost of fake news to the global economy. And the study um, estimated that the global economy is losing $78 billion each year from fake news circulating in the financial public health and business sectors, as well as in politics. Of the total cost, public health misinformation is costing the United States alone $9 billion caused by misinformation and vaccine preventable diseases and false information about vaccines. So what has been done so far to con control fake news? Well, in the area of regulation, the Philippine government has a fake news provision in the Buy and Hand to Heal as One Act. Um, prior to the pandemic, several legislations have been proposed against a fake news, such as House Bill 60022 and Senate Bill 1492 or the Anti-Fake News Act of 2017. However, uh, these did not gain traction in the legislative mill. Other countries also have their own uh, laws uh, for this purpose. Glo globally, however, regulations purportedly against uh, Fake news news uh, remain contentious and uh, controversial for a number of reasons. First is the difficulty of defining uh, fake news that raises the risk of excessive government regulation. Second is the argument that a fake news law could give the government uh, too much control over uh, uh, free speech. And third is the argument that it is tantamount to censorship. There are also websites that were put up that are dedicated to COVID-19 uh, information resources or um, a special section on, on, on COVID-19 in the official websites of government agencies, international organizations, and the academe. And you'll see some examples on the screen. Uh, Fact-checking initiatives of media organizations and research institutes are also on the rise. You can see some examples on the screen. And among these initiatives are, are Vera Files and uh, Rappler's own, own uh, fact-checking initiative. And I won't spend too much time on this as my co-presenters have uh, more knowledge and information on this topic. Okay, so let me end by giving some recommendations on how to combat fake news. Uh, first, it is important to increase awareness of online fact-checking tools, such as the websites that I've shown earlier, as well as um, applications and browser extensions that are publicly available. Unfortunately, awareness of these tools and how to use them is still low. Second, um, we need to acknowledge that misinformation is a societal problem. It's everybody's concern, it's everybody's problem. It's not just an issue for the government to solve or for the tech uh, companies or the media to address. And what better way 
um, to tackle misinformation than to engage everyone. Citizen engagement in fact-checking is vital to combat fake news. Third, uh, as I have um, mentioned in the, in the early part of the presentation, based on cognitive psychology, the propensity to fall prey on fake news is linked to poor analytical thinking and lack of reflective reasoning. As such, um, developing analytical thinking and digital intelligence early on in life among children in the home and school is very important. Fourth, it's also important that we make media uh, literacy part of the basic education curriculum. Four bills have been filed in Congress so far. And uh, last but not the least, let us all be part of the solution and not the problem. Uh, we need to remain vigilant. Misinformation is um, everybody's concern and we should uh, do our share in uh, combating fake news. We should make fact checking an automatic response if we receive information that we are unsure of. And as my final sentence, do not support personalities who spread fake news as well as those who produce false information. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Maraming salamat po. Thank you so much for that very uh, informative presentation, Ms. Sheila. And now that we've heard the presentations of uh, our speakers, uh, I think we are now ready for the open forum. But before that, I'd like to, to inform everyone that we'll be, we will be picking three names from our uh, WebEx participants, and each of them will receive a PIDS notebook. And I will announce the names of the winners before we close the webinar. Okay, so now looking at the uh, chat box, we receive a lot of um, interesting questions. So let me start. Okay, so let me read the first question. And this is from Mr. Jerry Von de la Cruz of uh, the Regional Office 6. Okay, this is actually uh, directed to our first speaker, Ms. Gemma, but uh, Ms. Gemma already left the meeting room but uh, she'll try to come back later. So here's the question. Um, so we'll try, we'll, we'll request the other uh, presenters or the other speakers to answer these. We start with um, Dr. Cabanez to be followed by uh, Professor Yvonne and then uh, Dr. Shiar. So here's the question. When the subject concerned of the investigation in the quest for the truth are the top leaders of an organization or even the country for that matter, what approach can be deemed effective and practicable in order to convey unbiased information without put, putting oneself at risk of the backlash resulting from the notoriety that the information may, may reveal? Okay, may I also uh, request um, Dr. Cabanez and uh, Dr. Ivo and Ms. Yvonne to please open your video. All right, thank you. Okay, so that's the question from um, Mr. Jerry Von de la Cruz. May we, may we hear from um, Dr. Ibanez first? Uh, from me? Yes. Yes, yes please. Uh, I, that's a very challenging question. I think when uh, you, you come up with, with, you know, this information that's connected to uh, very powerful people in, in, in an organization or in a society, uh, you know, you have to be prepared for whatever backlash there might be if uh, uh, if if you bring it out. Um, and uh, I, I do ex uh, remember that when we came out with the architects of uh, network disinformation, for example, uh, obviously we were uh, there were attempts to troll us, the, the research team. I uh, never received that many friend requests from strangers, <laughs> apart from that day when that report came out. And so uh, I think pr practically speaking for, for people who are doing work on this, uh, it, it's very important to be supportive of each other, to check on each other, how you are doing, not just in terms of physical safety, but like mental and emotional, uh, emo mentally and emotionally as well, because it, it, it can really be challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when we came out with the profit and politics report, we, uh, we were very explicit in, in the report that you know, we did posit different work models, including uh, the state-sponsored model. But we, we were very clear in saying this is based on news media reports because we were, as scholars, we were ne never able to see this because it's really quite hard to get uh, uh, information uh, about that. But we still got some um, some backlash on it. Uh, there were people who spoke against our report as 
uh, untrue. Uh, but I guess what you can do is stand your ground and, and just be clear about where you're coming from, where your information uh, is derived, uh, and, and the way that you present it uh, is, is scholarly, is, is nuanced, and uh, um, as, as transparent uh, as, as possible. And, and that's, that's really all you can do. Okay, thank you so much for that, Dr. Cabanes. May we hear, may we now hear from uh, Professor Chua? Um, as a fact checker, um, getting trolled and uh, getting attacked by government itself is not uh, something new. And uh, you'll notice that uh, this is something that you have, it's part of the hazards of the trade including attacks from government. If you, if you recall, when both Raptor and Verifal's fact check became a verified signatory of IFCN and subsequently a third party fact checker of Facebook, among the first to question and attack, the designation was government itself. They had, they had even asked Facebook if they could reconsider the decision uh, on, on several grounds. It continued to, uh, and even the press conferences of, let's say, presidential spokesperson Harry Rocky has also sought to undermine the credibility of fact checkers like Rapper and Facebook. But you just have to do the job as a uh, as uh, Dr. Cabanas mentioned, as Jason said, you have to stand your ground. But one of the things that um, I'd like to emphasize is to just let the facts speak for themselves. Let the evidence speak for itself. That's the most important thing. I know that as journalists, especially, we we the sto our tally, our storytelling skills uh, tell us that we should be as vivid as I'm gonna try to appeal to emotions, but in fact checking, I'd like to think that we should be as dispassionate as possible. Well said, um, Professor uh, Chua. Ms. Sheila, may we hear from you? Thank you, Wang. Um, I think the best strategy is to uh, simply provide evidence at PIDS. That's our, uh, uh, we always advocate for um, evidence-based, uh, you know, policy making, evidence-based program planning. And if you want to sound unbiased, then you should be objective, and you should uh, provide a balanced view. And uh, what better way to to be objective and to um, to provide a balanced uh, 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 view than to uh, present facts and evidence? Thank you, Ms. Sheila. So here's the response of Ms. Gemma to, to, the, to the question. What we try to do is to show how we arrive at our conclusion. This is why we explain our workflow and fact check methodology to our audience through our site and through the webinars. And then uh, she also added that, though I would, I would not say that there is a backlash, free approach to be honest, when people insist on speaking lies even after the facts have been like, clarified, fact checking becomes tantamount to calling people liars. That does not mean you do not fact check. It just means you need to stand your ground, stand by your findings. So yun po. that's uh, Ms. Gemma's response to your question, sir. And now uh, for the next question, this is from Mr. Keith of uh, DBM uh, Region 6. Okay, It is now scary that we can no longer easily determine what's factual from fake information in the digital world. As a millennial, the validation process, like taking into consideration the source, is another work to do. What actions should the government take in terms of filtering information in the virtual world? And um, he means, should policymakers and entrepreneurs collaborate to combat uh, this digital cancer? So um, we, I think we can start from um, Dr. Uh, from Professor from Professor Professor Yvonne. And then to be followed by Michelle, and then after that, uh, Dr. Cabanes. I get scared whenever government is mentioned, especially in the context of filtering information. I think they should not do that. On the contrary, they should be providing access to information, especially to those uh, in the public domain. That said, okay. um, there should be certainly collaboration in ensuring that good information is provided. As we all know, a lot of this is on the platform. so. Civil society, fact checkers, journalists can do their job, of course, of exposing or unmasking disinformation and disinformation players. But we also know that platforms also have to do uh, their share in uh, in, in ensuring that we we were we that everybody navigates a clean and safe uh, information space. 
Yes, Yvonne, uh, as a follow-up, do you, do you have like um, a collaboration with government, your group? Uh, so far, um, there are government agencies have uh, requested not just uh, our group, but mm -hmm. uh, fact checkers in general um, mm -hmm. to have to to hold fact checking uh, seminars and webinars. Hmm. Okay. I I have I have some like I said I sorry this is public but I have some hesitation at times especially I look at the group and what I'm going to talk about, who I'm going to address because am I equipping you to fight for good or am I equipping you to further your propaganda or negative propaganda so that's one thing I take into account before say agreeing to train government officials especially those who are in public information no offense meant it's just a personal stand. Okay, thank you for that candid um, quest, uh, answer or response, Miss uh, Miss Yvonne. And now, um, may we hear from uh, uh, Dr. Cabanias? Yes. Would you like um, to say something about this? Yeah, uh, uh, I, I agree with, with Yvonne that uh, the last thing we want is censorship, right? Uh, State regulating uh, information. Uh, and, and that's why in, in the study that our team has put out, we really emphasize this the structural dimension of this information, which means that, and of this information production, which means that the response should also address those structural realities. Uh, and, and one way to do that is not towards censorship, but towards uh, regulating the production of this information itself. Uh, one way to do this is campaign finance regulation, for example, particularly the digital. Because our electoral code is very good with mainstream media, not necessarily that it's followed, but there are rules like how many minutes you should be on air, what's the size of your poster, how much do you spend. In digital, there's nothing. So it's a free for all. And I think that that really uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, we were working with Congressman Manuel Zabiri previously. Uh, there was a bill that was, I think a couple of bills that, was, that were filed. Yeah, lang it died like, in the first reading or something, so it hasn't really progressed. Maybe someone should uh, pick that up and, and carry on looking at the campaign finance regulation. That, so there's, there's, that's one avenue. The other is, uh, has to do with the industry itself, self-regulation with the ad and PR industry, and also very crucial, self-regulation with the digital influencer industry. At least ad and PR, you have things like PANA, you, mm -hmm. you, know, you have media regulatory, self-regulatory mechanisms but with the digital influencers there's nothing and so i think they need to think about that okay thank you so much uh dr cabanas michila um oh thank you wen for for that question uh mm -hmm. speaking of uh legislating a fake news because that was was i i also agree with uh my my co-presenters and their views about um uh legislating a fake news for me it would be risky to to legislate a fake news law in the philippines give, given the state of our institutions i mean i would easily say yes but it would have been different if you have effective institutions because that are transparent and and respect the rule of law no and um, a fake news uh law that has a broad uh definition of fake news is also prone to abuse because it, it is open to uh, a wide range of interpretation um which uh, unscrupulous people could use to fit their own motives eh? so for me i would go for measures that uh, i think would have more long-term effects and less open to exploitation such as strengthening of, of self-regulation supporting civic initiatives such as uh, fact checking and developing the analytical thinking of our young people early on in the home and school okay michelle thank you so much so here's the response of uh, Ms. Gemma. I would say that uh, people in government who see the value of data-driven decision-making need to speak up and really call out efforts to distort. So that's her uh, response. And then uh, here's another interesting question from Mr. Marlo Luguban of NEDACAR, and he asks, how do disinformation actors get results? Does the funding of trolls play the biggest factor in dictating the narrative, or does chance play a bigger factor? More hit or miss? Should fact-based entities rely on the same PR tactics to compete for the digital? For, so, would like to go first? 
I defer this to uh, Professor Cabanas and okay. uh, uh, Professor uh, Chua who have done more uh, systematic research on this issue. All right. Okay. So, doc, uh, we we go first um, to Doctor. Uh, I mean, Miss Yvonne, can you please uh, um, go first, and then to be followed by Doctor Cabanas. Thank you. Jason, you want to go first while I compose my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think, well, one of the, the things that, that uh, I, I mentioned in, in my uh, recent writing on, on the imaginative dimension of this information is that we, one of my suggestions uh, is to really turn digital disinformation on its head by using the exact same tactics of these disinformation producers, but for the good, of course. Uh, we, we know in advertising and PR, there's these terms called like, uh, white hat and, and black hat operations. So we can use it in, in a white hat kind, kind of sense. And what I mean by using these same techniques is not to spread vitriol and, and misogyny and all of that, but to connect also with the deep stories of people. Because that's really, well, talking to these, these information producers, and that's really their expertise. They know how to pulse what people are thinking and that they weaponize and exploit that. And we can use the same tactic, but not to weaponize and exploit, but to connect with that. And so that we are able to deliver our counter disinformation messages clearly. Of course, the question, and this is, this is why I guess we need collaboration with people like uh, Yvonne and Gemma. I said, I can say all of these things, but I don't know how exactly uh, that can be done. And uh, it's, it's the white hat, you know, experts who, who might have a, um, a more ideas about how you, you uh, operationalize that. But I think it's really important that we recognize what these, these information producers do and, and see how we can, you know, use that to our own advantage as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much for that. Okay, so uh, here's what Ms. Gemma said. Uh, it is, uh, okay, they test messages and repeat those that gain traction over and over again. And she added, it is repetition that drives results repeat a lie a thousand times and it becomes the truth okay so um here's another question from from mr keith uh, sensoro okay so uh, social media companies have made available their precise ability to determine and reach consumers that not just for business interests but also political organizations in the philippines in 2016 uh, various candidates, notably Rodrigo Duterte, were able to effectively use social media to their advantage in terms of raising awareness, acceptability, and eventually electability. Social media was used to amplify normal cognitive biases of um, people with no consistent regard for facts. In many cases, outright fa falsehoods were propagated with ease and targeted to those susceptible for conver conversion to one political side over another. Hence, the 2016 Philippine election shows how social media provides serious uh, incentives not to speak factually and truthfully in high stakes activities such as elections. So the question now is, do social media platforms such as Facebook have liabilities on these? Hmm. Okay, so I think, um, Dr. Cabanas, would you like to uh, to respond to that, or would you like to say anything about that question? Uh, I I would say that I uh, which which has been the theme of I think all the speakers is that uh, solving the the issue of digital disinformation is a multi pronged approach, and mm -hmm. part of that is of course the the platform uh, the platform themselves uh, that they need to recognize uh, how their platforms are being exploited and. To find ways to to address that, um, and uh, I, I have to be, I guess, transparent that I, I have mm -hmm. done work with with Facebook uh, research projects uh, with them, uh, and uh, I, I have an NDA. But like the, the the kind of broad strokes insight that that I can say is that uh, there are different people in the institution, and those that prioritize the ethical uh, questions are not necessarily in the center of the discussions. It's still very tech and science driven. Uh, they need to be part of that conversation uh, rather than uh, you know, coming in belatedly when there are uh, 
problems already. So you know there are there are people in these I'm sure in these platforms who are also working to, to correct the the direction, but but they need to be more central to to the discussions. Uh, so that, that's what I can say about that. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Cabanes. Here's a question from Mr. Mamerto Bernabe Jr. How can information be checked for facts when co when cost is dis downplayed with students and lay and trap in circular resourcing of unverified material? That is, even some experts are gagged to talk about the Cebu Zero candidate results at the time of the Hello Garcia scandal. Um, let us hear first the, um, the the answer or the response of uh, Miss Yvonne. Hello, Garcia. So 2015, 2014. I remember that because I was still with the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism. And I remember how uh, government itself had threatened media networks of uh, violating the anti wiretapping law if they should uh, broadcast it. But at PCIJ, we decided to release or upload the entire recordings of the Hello, Garcia tape. So it's true that there is always threat of gagging, especially among government officials. And that's why government officials and employees sometimes become ineffective when it comes to information as information disseminators. And that's why the public, um, the journalists have to do their jobs to ensure that uh, the information is still put out. Uh, we've always said that information is a public good, especially reliable, accurate, verified information. But it also means that we have to empower citizens on how to ferret out the truth, how to do and that's where the research skills, verification skills come in. Not mm -hmm. So it's it could be true that you won't be able. There's a gag, there's a gag order, especially on the part of government. But it doesn't mean that the information won't reach the public because the public can easily access that through other means. Thank you so much for that, um, Miss Yvonne. How about uh, Dr. Sher would like to say something about the question? I think regardless of one's profession, uh, mm -hmm. the journalist kaman yan, nasa media kaman, ano, we have a moral and civic uh, responsibility to mm -hmm. ensure that uh, false information is not, um, you know, um, circulating and um, only only um, um, only the right information, only truth comes out, no? Kasi otherwise, um, kung ibibigay lang natin yung, ano, yung, uh, responsibility sa mga journalists. Nasabi nga ng mga kasamahan ko, this is a a a, uh, a societal issue. As I, I also mentioned this in my presentation, everyone has to do it, his or own part in combating fake news. Yes, that's true. Uh, Rowena, I just yes, have to yeah. fact check myself. I think I said 2015. It should be 2005 <laughs> in Hello Garcia. <laughs> Sorry about <Thank> that. <laughs> We note that, ma'am. Okay. How about Dr. Cabanas? Would you like to share your your thoughts on the on the question? Yeah. Uh, uh, I think, while uh, of course, fact checking is, is very very important. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, if, if one and I have been on, uh, uh, you know, project. Uh, I mean, on on uh, what they call it, those uh, caravans mm -hmm. uh, in the country to uh, address media literacy and, and fact checking. Uh, but also, we do know that we are fighting with experts, you know, people mm -hmm. who are very, very good with this. And it's their job to do this thing. And, and so the other thing, alongside, whilst we're doing fact-checking, whilst we're doing media literacy, we really need to stem it at the source. Mm -hmm. You see, it's such a burden for us individuals. Imagine us trying to do all this fact-checking in the midst of all this overwhelming disinformation. So whilst we're doing that, we need to also stem the tide by, by uh, addressing the source, which is the mm -hmm. production uh, of it, less less disinformation produced, uh, easier for us in terms of dealing with them. Here's a related question from uh, Miss Elena Pernia. Apart from Professor uh, Chu was a journalism class on fact checking. Are there initiatives in basic education on fact checking? Perhaps. Uh, Dr. Cabanes, uh, would you like to answer that, or would you like to uh, to say something about this? Mm. I'm I'm not very familiar with uh, what what's happening with basic education, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to share. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing. I will just finished our uh, the first half of our uh, research on how Filipinos engage. It's, a, it's an ethnographic research on how Filipinos engage with uh, digital disinformation. We, we, we're done with a Manila leg. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the things that struck me so much, and uh, 
Um, I think Yvonne and I should have a discussion on this afterwards over coffee and maybe have a project on this. Is teachers challenging what is in the textbook? Uh, like, uh, uh, so it, it, I don't know how, how that can be addressed. I, I think it has to do with like how polarized history is, for example. Uh, and so what, even if what's written in the textbook is a, you know, says a certain kind of thing, uh, some teachers would say, oh, actually, hindi naman ganyan yung experience ko noon. So, mm -hmm. uh, corrected, ganyan. So, uh, I think we, we need to look into that as well. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an education expert, and, mm -hmm. uh, all, but I, it just struck me that even at the level of basic education, contested in facts. Um, and, and so, I don't know how, how we should begin thinking of addressing that. Okay. Well, if I may uh, yes, add something, yes, Michelle, yes um, on on uh, uh, on whether um, fact checking is uh, included in the basic education cur curriculum. Actually, that is why um, in my recommendation, I, I I said that we should make uh, uh, media literacy part of of, of the curriculum. Because sa ngayon wala siya. Eh. But we have mm -hmm. al we already have four bills uh, filed in Congress. Mm -hmm. Um, which uh, uh, proposing um, that uh, proposing the inclusion of social media literate, uh, social media literacy in the school curriculum. Mm -hmm. So um, senior high school naman, there is a subject called media and information literacy. Uh, but it is a general course and uh, not focused on uh, developing media literacy skills. Okay. So that's a gap that needs to be addressed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a big gap. Uh, yeah. Miss Yvonne? Yeah, Rowena, yes, so like like uh, what Sheila, uh, Dr. Sharp pointed out, mm -hmm. ang MIL natin is in Sheila, senior high school. Sheila, it's okay. <laughs> it's, Sheila pointed out, ang MIL natin is at uh, senior high school level, no? uh, okay. year, year 11, and that's not enough because our students are exposed as young as, you know, seven-year-old, eight years old, even if officially it's supposed to be 13. Uh, what we'll notice is uh, UNESCO itself has already modified uh, its MIL, Right, it's MRL guidelines to include um, disinformation and critical thinking as part of the curriculum. We are looking to seeing our schools basic education if in, incorporate that, and that would include verification skills. But it doesn't have; it should not be just in a course. It should be integrated in different courses. Pretty much like when you start teaching them what is news, what is what in social science, English, or math. Uh, the same should be with uh, disinformation or and The thing is, and I just want to point this out, is many of our students are not even aware of what is uh, legitimate news organizations. You ask a grade four student, I've asked that before, they don't even know what the inquirer is, so they don't know the sources, the, the, ver the legitimate sources that sh they should be turning to. So this is already an indicator that we should not just limit ourselves to senior high school, we should really yes. go beyond. And we should also go beyond formal education, as we know, mm -hmm. as data have shown um, the our, our parents, our aunties, our titas, titos, they are among the worst purveyors of disinformation, <laughs> well-meaning, well-meaning though they may be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. thank you so much for that, uh, Miss Yvonne. And, and Wang, if I may, uh, yes, uh, sure, Michelle. And if we go, if we go back to what uh, cognitive psychologists mm -hmm. say about, you know, uh, why people would fall prey on fake news, no, mm -hmm. it's because of the lack of analytical thinking and lack of reflective reasoning, no. So hindi naman ka agad agad niyan. Alam mo, pag matanda ka na, saka ka magtuturo ng analytical thinking and uh, reflective reasoning. Dapat bata yeah. pa lang ma-educate mo na, maturuan na yung mga bata. Hindi lang sa school, no? Kahit sa bahay. Yes, yeah, so let's start them young. Okay, mm -mm. so, as, uh, and then, uh, here's, a, I think, a rel uh, related question to that um, by, uh, it was sent, it was sent by Mr. Teodoro Nicolas Dulay. A few more questions, sabi niya. So, number one question is that, um, what strategies do lay people typical, typically use to verify the information they receive? And then number two, Potentially more of a philosophical question, sabi niya, how much do appeals to or strategy, strategies that use reason and logic address mis and disinformation? And then um, what alternatives are there to address to uh, addressing the short term disinformation situation in conjunction with the more long term education strategy? So, uh, Ms. Yvonne, would you like to go first? 
<laughs> um, strategies and uh, no. yes. uh, immediate. I think mm -hmm. uh, I've heard this many times, and I'm sure you've experienced that when you receive a piece of disinformation from family, friends, in a chat group, in your messaging app. And the thing is, or over conversation, dinner conversations is about fake news, and you end up fighting about it because, and it becomes so polarizing. The environment becomes so polarizing in the environment. Mm -hmm. um, my students, uh, a number of my students, um, we found one way, and that is to they don't engage in, you know, uh, a debate. What they do instead, and they found it very useful, is just just forward a fact check or information more about that uh, because it's fact based, it's evidence based. But what do you do with people who are offline? That is the bigger challenge, and that is where you need uh, community leaders, your church, your friends. You have to make them converts to truthful information who will be also who will make it also their uh, mission to distribute correct and verified information. Hindi siya mabilis. Like I said, it's a whole of society approach. Uh, dapat sabay-sabay. Marami yan. It's not just, like I said, like Jason pointed out, and I keep stressing, it's not just fact-checking. It's not just MIL. Marami pang pwedeng gawin. But we need to find, um, hindi man lang champions eh. We need to find people who will live every day, who are willing to live every day and find every day the truth. Okay, thank you so much for that, uh, Miss Yvonne. How about um, may I uh, may we hear from Miss Sheila? Okay, uh, that's a three prong question. Question, no? yes. Okay, um, ako medyo medyo ano sa akin yung yung kasi if you fight yung architects of disinformation mahirap yun eh, no? Kasi Kasi sabi nga ni Jason and also yung sa research ni Ma'am Yvonne, you know, para kasi siyang organized syndicate, it's coordinated mm -hmm. action. So ako, uh, for me, the more pragmatic approach uh, would be to educate people on how to react to fake news or mm -hmm. suspicious information. Because sa akin, it is what the receiver does that will determine whether fake news will have an effect. It's the behavior of the audience or the, the receiver um and, and as such it is the be behavior of the receiver that we can influence and the ideal approach that we are saying is to be analytical and to fact check first make these an automatic response okay so thank you so much for that miss sheila uh here's from miss adora rodriguez what can you say about many vloggers who oftentimes influence people and how can you help the public find more what is factual than what is not so how do you, how can we help yeah because there are many bloggers especially now that uh, everyone is online so marami talaga tayong mga vloggers ngayon and uh, of course sabi natin um they 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 sometimes uh mga tao talaga they don't check yung uh, yung mga nakukuha nilang information so how do we now help uh, the public okay na na um salain yung mga information nila so yeah, that's the question. So, um, Nan, you know, convey no mga no mga bloggers. Yes, yes. Uh -oh. so, so, I can simply do not um, follow these mm -hmm. bloggers, kasi mm -hmm. pag pagkakakitaan pa nila yung <laughs> yung mga false information na nilalagay nila sa mga blogs nila. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yes, uh, I agree with you, Michelle. Na dapat medyo. I think it's more of a new way of um. Helping, helping them siguro understand ano yung, ano yung factual, ano yung hindi, parang ganon. So, yeah, and there are many webinars naman on this. So, they can just um, siguro magbasa sila and all. So, yun. Uh, Rowena, mahirap, yes, yes, yes. Lang, mahirap umasa lang sa webinars kasi mm -hmm. tandaan natin na meron tayong 22% ng Pilipino mm -hmm. or nearly 28% na yes, wala, hindi, wala, wala sa internet. Um, okay. Pero gusto ko lang sana i-point out na mm -hmm. um, studies have shown that, for example, ang in Nordic countries, no, okay. in the Scandinavian countries, mm -hmm. hindi masyado kumakalat ang fake news. Or okay. if they do, hindi kumakalat. Meron, pero hindi kaano kumakalat. The distribution is not as, say, uh, worrisome as, say, those in, ano. And there was one factor that they noticed when they were trying to identify the factors. They have a highly media literate society. So, mm -hmm. talaga, talaga, yeah. media literacy. Media literacy, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, may, may I also just, just add, uh, connecting to uh, what, what 
Sheila said about you know, the cognitive factors no, that, that are uh, at play and how that, that connects to uh, what, what Ivan has been saying about media literacy. Uh, sorry, I just have a response to this because we just finished uh, with, with our, our work on this, so it's not well thought through. But uh, w one of the things that, that we also saw in our, uh, in, in our research is that this idea of, of fact-checking is being distorted on the ground by, by people. So they think they are fact-checking. They say that they follow the steps of fact-checking. And I heard this so much. Uh, uh, I'm not like other people who are, this is a quote, who are dumb and who don't fact-check. I fact-check. I, I, when I see something in the news, I look at other sources of information. And when we pursue and ask them, so what are these sources of information? I am not the vloggers, the YouTube videos. Uh, so imagine I did this start your idea no fact check. Fact -checking, fact -checking, yes. With mm -hmm. cognitive processes, yes, but also yes. the idea of fact checking itself that we need to be clear that it has what, what credible sources are, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I, I think we need to keep our ear on the ground and incorporate this in how we're teaching our young people uh, because it's a long term project in, in fact checking and media literacy. Right, sure. Yeah, right. So here's another question from Mr. Uh, Marlo Lubguban of Nedakar. So uh, his question is that, should fact-based entities rely on the same PR tactics to compete for digital reach? So, uh, Ms. Yvonne? Um, yung tactics naman, neutral eh. Mm -hmm. Techniques, tactics, platforms, they're all neutral. It's how you use or misuse them that's mm -hmm. critical. So I think that's the short answer to okay. the question. Uh, Ms. Sheila? Um, no, I have nothing to say to that. I, I okay. think uh, Professor Ibon has um, given a, a very good response. Okay. Oh, here's another question from Ms. Leonora Gonzalez. I think it does not help, sabi niya, that even WHO and other official sources also, also change their views, which is the nature of how the virus also evolves. For example, how does the, the virus spread? Even WHO seems to change their views about it in the air, on surfaces, again, not to blame them because the facts also, also change as the scientists provide more and changing data. Any views on how to address fake news given these unique um, dynamics? Michelle, I think this is something- I, I think, ano kasi naman eh, the scientists are in a very difficult uh, mm -hmm. situation now, you know. Um, this is an evolving uh, disease, no? Mm -hmm. So, very fluid yung, yung information pa rin na nakukuha natin. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Siguro ang ano ko na lang is uh, this is also this is related to, to the ano of, um, um, although not really uh, answering uh, her question directly. Mm -hmm. Ang kailangan natin ay, ay are scientists who can communicate well with the public, who are willing to go down the level of ordinary citizens to explain mm -hmm. technical information in uh, EC to understand and less over, overwhelming language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So, Miss Yvonne, would you like to add to what Miss Sheila said? Um, kagaya ni sinabi nga niya, science keeps mm -hmm. evolving. So, abilis no, from the earth is flat to the, from yeah. the earth is flat to the earth is round. <laughs> diba? Yung mga ganyan. So, kailangan din, really, scientists should make it a point to, you know, impart their findings as soon as possible. And that's like right. she said, mm -hmm. in a layman's way, no? And that's mm -hmm. where uh, science communication comes in. When we say science mm -hmm. communication, it is really an attempt to laymanize, diba? Help yeah. scientists laymanize or uh, reach out to, as well as for journalists to understand, diba, and other media practitioners to understand the language of science. Yeah, that's right. And if I, think, if I may add to that, uh, Miss Wang, no, I, yes. I think more than ever we we need more science communicators mm -hmm. now who can yeah. help our scientists uh, relay the message to the to the public. Science communication, because it's a different field in communication. Eh. it requires a good understanding of uh, scientific information to ensure that. The message will be accurate while imparting it in a language that is easy for the yeah. public to grasp. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think um, uh, you all, your response, your uh, your your answers have already. Uh, I mean, the question of Mr. Jason Payumo has already been answered. Ang sabi niya kasi, how do we make data or fact checking? Uh, be understood by the ordinary masses. So, yun po, yun yun po yung sagot, Mr. Jason. And then, um, 
okay okay and then he said uh kay mr jason payumo sabi niya um what are the strategies to convert uh, fact checking to the language of the masses so yun po nasagot na uh and then what else okay sabi ni this is from miss uh, mildred dano uh, she's from deped sabi niya there are efforts to fight fake news in fact the office of usec omali has ongoing talks with the National Privacy Commission to fight the spread the spread of the fake news. So thank you for that, um, Ms. Mildred. Thank you for uh, sharing that information to us. Okay, and then, uh, what else? Okay, sabi ni uh, Ms. Elena Pernia, I agree with, with Yvonne, sabi niya. I, MIL needs to be brought down to the grade school level. MIL is lifelong learning, sabi niya. Okay. And then here's another from Ms. Elena Pernia. Just to add to the talk on the infodemic, Philippine research data from 2020 show that when it comes to COVID-19 related information, social media are highly used, 71%, uh, but among the least trusted, 13%. News uh, channel on TV enjoy high use, which is 69%, as well as some level of trust, 53%. And... Um, Okay, and here's our question. Can we take this as some hope in social media users' critical or analytical thinking? Um, Ms. Yvonne, would you like to go first to be followed by Ms. Sheila and then Dr. Caban, yes? Um, yes, yes, please. Pakiulit pake lang, <laughs> sorry. Yung question niya, ma'am, is um, can we take this as some hope in, in social media users, critical um, ah, okay. analytical thinking. Oh, uh, anything that provides us hope, gusto natin niya, di ba? Uh, but it is, um, we've seen nga, like I said, um, there is somehow, uh, you, but you know, yung ganung klase, you really need to educate also the social media users. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things, you really need to educate the social media users. I think one of the questions I, uh, I've often asked uh, mm -hmm. when running webinars or even in class of mm -hmm. uh, my students and others is uh, before you or when you created your account on social media, did you read the community standards? Mm -hmm. Standards. And many would say they haven't even read it. Even journalists haven't read the community standards. Kasi doon pa lang, if you read that, then things would, it's supposed to be, things are supposed to be better if you understand what the standards are, the norms in the community. So, uh, ako isa yan, isa, isang starting point. Uh, is mm -hmm. there hope? Yes. But one of the starting point would be, please, be before your child or anyone or is uh, starts uh, doing social media or if you haven't done so, please read the community standards because that is where we begin to develop and uh, I know res respect for another people's voice. We know how to behave online. Okay, thank you so much, um, uh, Ms. Yvonne. Uh, Ms. Sheila, would you like to um, say something about the question? of? Uh, yeah, de definitely there is hope and the fact mm -hmm. that there is uh, an increasing number of these fact-checking initiatives, you know, Mm -hmm. reflect uh the uh the desire of of people you know of uh, not just media companies not just rappler but uh mm -hmm. you know educators etc that uh we really want to to um to fight this issue you know to combat this uh to combat fake news um in one of my recommendations sabi ko ang daming mga available na mga fact checking tools Mga websites, uh, browser extensions, applications. Kaya lang there's still no literacy on on how to use these uh, tools, no. So I think that's a uh, um, a good starting point would be you know to uh, increase awareness and education on this uh, mga available fact checking tools that the public can easily can easily mm -hmm. access and use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agree. Uh, Doctor Cabanes, would you like to add to what they said? Yeah. Um... Interesting. Thank, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Pernia. Because mm -mm. when we were doing the interviews, one of the things I thought people would trust mainstream media less now because of all the attacks. Uh, but it is true. People still trust the mainstream media. And a lot of them say that if I see it on social media, and Yvonne mentioned earlier, yung mga celebrity deaths, they check <laughs> mainstream media. Na, so actually, they still rely 
uh, people still rely heavily on, on mainstream media. So there is hope uh, in that sense. But I also wanted to add, we've talked about science communication as, as very important to uh, countering this information. But another, alongside uh, science communication, I think uh, we, we sometimes forget is the value of entertainment media and how it shapes our imaginaries of the world. True. I think it's very crucial to have movies, to have TV series that hindi yung hard sell, ha, but like background yung history. And then my love story or whatever, but just actual factual historical uh, details in the background, which will implant in people that, oh, yeah, I remember that this was what the 60s, the 70s, the 80s uh, was like. You, you see it in some K dramas, for example. Why don't we use that too? So this is also a call for um, media producers and historians to collaborate with each other. The historians have the content, the media producers have the communicative skills, why not work together? This is a second avenue alongside science communication too. Okay, so I think we are uh, down to our last question because uh, we are already uh, nearing the uh, closing or the end of our webinar. So the question is from Sheramon Lacambra and he asks, how do fact checkers validate facts? Do they coordinate well with well-meaning institutions or private only? Or does it also involve government apparatus or who appoints fact checkers? Because like media, he said, uh, which is owned by men with vested interests, they are beholden to something. I hope it is only the, the truth. So Ms. Yvonne, since you're on fact checking, would you would, fact checking uh, would you like to go first? Uh there are standards for fact checking. That's the good thing. Um, early on, the IFCN International Fact Checking Network already set the standards as early as 2016 for everybody to observe, and that would be it, come, it applies to methodology, uh, funding, organization, selection of fact checks, and all that. So that one, I mean, if in order to evaluate a fact check or a fact checking institution, you it is good to evaluate them against those standards set by the international standards set by the IFCN. But there are many ways to validate and uh, um, it will take us a whole day to show you what are the mm -hmm. tools that yeah. we use in order to validate information. But to just make a long answer short, ang paggamit ng primary sources is one of the most important things that fact checkers use. Getting the other side to ensure balance is also under that. And that, when you say getting the other side, involves even getting information from government. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Yvonne, for that uh, response. Um, how about um, Dr. Cabanes? Uh, I'm not really privy to this, this uh, fact checking uh, mm -hmm. uh, initiative, so uh, I completely agree with, with Yvonne. Okay, so Ms. Sheila, would you like to, to like add to what they said? Uh, with all due respect, uh, <laughs> I, I, I defer that question to uh, so, my uh, colleagues who have more okay. knowledge on fact checking. Okay, so thank you so much. So uh, uh, for your um, very comprehensive and uh, insightful um, answers, but uh, we have to wrap up our, uh, our discussion now. But before that, may I request each of the speaker to uh, give their final words. Let's start first with uh, Professor Cabanas to be followed by Assistant Professor Chua and then uh, Ms. Sheila. Professor Cabanas. I, I guess very quickly, uh, just want to emphasize that uh, part of the solution to digital disinformation is, is really structural and, and, and the, the production side really matters. and and. One last thing I wanted to say is that behind the disinformation are, you know, this, some, some of them are, of course, you have the chief architects. We completely blame for what's going on. But there's also the digital workers who are, have been put into the digital underground. And we need to also legislate to provide, it's a growing industry, you know, freelancing and all of that, especially in the pandemic, people have moved into doing these kinds of jobs. Let's give them social safety nets uh, so that they, they're not tempted to do this information work. I know that in Senate and Congress, there's a, uh, there are files, uh, bills filed for the Nat National Digital Careers Act. I, I hope that really prospers and, and we, we protect our digital workers so that they, they don't have to do these kinds of things anymore. Okay. Thank you so much, Ma sir. Uh, Ms. Yvonne, please. Um, the 
Well, the dangers of disinformation are only too real. And uh, in the case of the Philippines, we have uh, a large portion of our society, as I pointed out, is exposed to it. I've always believed, and I keep, I sound like a broken record, sorry, and it shows my age. I even use the term broken record, no? I sound like a broken record, but I really am, am a firm believer of a whole of society approach that would involve initiatives from different sectors. But I believe that the, the the, the initiative should not be initiated singly. Collaboration across sectors is very important. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Yvonne, Ms. Sheila. Um, okay, I, I will not belabor the the uh, the points that I have raised in in my uh, or earlier, but I just want to emphasize that uh, it, it's about time now that we need to acknowledge that uh, fake news is, is a, a whole of society problem, just like what my colleagues, what my uh, co fellow co-presenters have mentioned. It's, it's everybody's uh, problem. No, I already mentioned this. It's not an issue for, you know, for journalists, for media outfits, for the government to solve. So um, citizen engagement is, is, is vital to, to uh, combat uh, misinformation and disinformation. And uh, I would like to end by by really thank by by thanking uh um Michelle. Okay, I think uh we lost Michelle. So uh okay. So moving on as a sign of our gratitude to our speakers this morning. Okay, we have prepared a certificate of appreciation for each of them. We have the certificates flash on the screen and let me read the text. Okay, Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines or SERPI project present this uh, certificate of uh, appreciation to the name of the speaker for imparting his her invaluable knowledge and expertise as a resource, resource person during the PIDS public webinar on less noise, more facts, information dissemination for a better normal conducted as part of the sixth SERPI network biennial meeting given this 28th of July 2020 at PIDS Quezon City Philippines signed by Dr. Celia Reyes PIDS president. So once again we'd like to thank our speakers for sharing with us their knowledge and expertise this morning. They all deserve a virtual clap from from us. Okay. Thank you for Thank you po. Maraming salamat po sa inyo. So at this point, let me announce, okay, Gwen, the three winners of the PIDS notebook. All right. So here are the winners. Okay. Jonathan Bonaobra, Lira Victoria Lascano, and Sarina Viduya. I repeat, Jonathan Bonaobra, Lira or Lyra Victoria Lascano, and Sarina Viduya. Okay. So um, by the way, here's the notebook. Our team or the PIDS, uh, the PIDS uh, webinar team will coordinate with you regarding the del delivery of the notebook. Okay, so um, now let me call on uh, PIDS um, senior research um, Aniseta or, or Beta for his closing remarks, sir. I now turn the floor to you, Dr. Orbeta. Dr. Orbeta. Yes, sir. Sir, we can't hear you. Okay, sir. We can now we can see you, but but we cannot hear you, sir. Sir, sir, can you hear us? I I think you're muted. I think you're on mute. Gwen? Hi, hi, uh, Dr. Urbeta. Um, can you try muting and unmuting your microphone? Okay, um, I think uh, he's having some uh, technical problems, Gwen. Okay, um, let me just... Hi, Dr. Urbeta. Okay.
Dr. Arbeda. Okay, so I think uh, Dr. Arbeta is having uh, some problems on his audio. So uh, let's proceed with the with the closing. Okay. Before we uh, finally say goodbye, all right. So we have some announcement to make. May I request Mike to just flash the the the, the PowerPoint presentations? You may access and download the presentations on the PIDS website. Flash on the screen is the link to our website. Also, please answer the feedback form that will pop up on your screen. Your comments are, are important to us to improve our webinars. We also want to encourage everyone to regularly visit our website and social media pages, as well as the SERPI FB page. Okay, so it's fb.com slash SERPI PH. PH. Also, likewise, we would like to thank all those who have tuned in on our uh, Facebook page and those who followed our to, uh, uh, our live tweets. Uh, also, flash on the screen is our forthcoming webinar happening on August 12. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, this is co-organized with the Department of the Interior and Local Government. And the webinar title is Local Government's PDP and SDG Localization Efforts as Contribution to National Development. We hope to see you in this event. And then um, finally, we'd like to thank all representatives from the government, academe, private sector, civil society, and, interna and international organization who joined us today. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Orbeta's audio has already been fixed. Dr. Or Orbeta, please, I now give you the floor. Uh, can you hear me? There's a bit of an echo, sir. Dr. Orbeta? OK. OK. okay. Uh, there's, an, there's an echo. Okay. Yes, there's a, an echo. Sir? About now. Uh, okay na po. Okay. Uh, the floor is sorry. Now yours, sir. Yes, it's okay. Sorry. Uh, okay, so the uh, Ms. Uh, Mendoza, Professor Cabanez, uh, Professor Chua, Dr. Shiar, and participants, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this seminar's theme of less noise, more facts, improving information dissemination for a better normal for the sixth SERPI Binyal meeting can't be more appropriate, appropriate given how noise has affected our trust in our information sources, such as the internet. Uh, one of the PIDS mandate uh, is to establish a repository of economic research information, SERPI was established 20 years ago uh, to partly uh, uh, fulfill this mandate. Our objective then was to have a common place to share socioeconomic research outputs uh, of uh, research institutions around the country. Electronic portal was uh, novel then. And to see how SERP has grown and, and, and been sustained is very fascinating to me. I congratulate Sheila and, and her team uh, and RID for, for nourishing uh, uh, SRP. Internet used to be taken as a growing encyclopedia where we get reliable information about anything. This perspective has changed with the rise of fake news. If we don't succeed in controlling fake news, this may make uh, the internet be a, a growing uh, state of encyclopedia, growing garbage dump. That is how important the battle against fake news is. So if you're asking why we should care about fake news or what's in it for me, this is uh, really a choice between feasting on wholesome stories or being fed literally by garbage. Uh, it's a, use, a waste of time, as you should know, uh, to be forced to fact check every information that we receive. And as an economist, uh, we have scarce resources and time is very and we don't want to be forced into doing that. I'm, I'm, I'm just happy to know that we are fighting back to reclaim what we lost or we are, lo are losing in the world to understand the sources of this information. So we effectively fight back and begin to trust again our information sources. Some of the highlights of the presentations, I am educating myself. I'm uh, really new uh, in this area. Uh, Ms. Mendoza described for us how to fact check and uh, how important the tracing where the pieces of information are coming from. Uh, 
in order to understand uh, our source and, 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 and how to handle it better. Professor Cabanias described to us how this information is produced uh, and the hierarchy of this information production uh, from chief architects, digital influencers, and community level fake account operators. He sounded the alarm. I'm very much, uh, uh, this is close to my heart. He sounded the alarm that digital workers are being exploited by the industry, which we should be concerned about. Uh, fact checking also has uh, been uh, tackled by Professor Chua uh, from the academic sense, and, and of course, his, his, uh, her uh, experience with Vera Files. And uh, I'm just amazed to know that uh, that uh, we are one of the uh, uh, country with the highest exposure to this information. And uh, and the biggest channel of this uh, this information is Facebook. Uh, used to be people are happy that we have Facebook, but now maybe not so much. And uh, the, he showed in statistics that the ones that are not checking are the very the young ones and the very old ones. Mm -hmm. So maybe that should be the target of 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 of, of uh, digital education, and uh, how he wished uh, to go back to the idea that journalism is about truth telling, accuracy, and fact checking. Uh, finally, Dr. Shar uh, has, has described for us the difference between misinformation, which is an innocent the, uh, dissemination of fake information, and disinformation, which is really deliberate and and. And this, this too, and he, she mentioned uh, uh, five recommendations of increasing awareness and education, teaching citizens on fact checking and uh, early and developing analytical thinking uh, and digital intelligence also uh, starting among children and media literacy and in basic education curriculum and being part of the solution. So uh, that's what I learned from the, uh, I learned a lot and then I have to digest uh, all of these presentations. And uh, the discussion, of course, with the your active participation has resulted in uh, to a lively and uh, very responsive, uh, uh, diving uh, deeply into the issues that have been presented. Uh, let me now th thank again our resource uh, persons for sharing the valuable time. We would like to express our appreciation as well to the participants and glad that you choose to spend your morning with us. Uh, the signals you are interested in fighting back and just rely and not just rely on journalists. Uh, I'd like to the key words, I think, uh, the key phrase, I should say, uh, for the morning is that uh, it's the emphasis that this is a whole of society approach. This is not the problem of uh, reporting or journalism, but the pr problem of everyone. So uh, we should face it, uh, uh, all of us should face it and do our, our, our part. So hope to see you again in the, the next public forum and a special thanks to the, uh, our, the, our research and information department for making this happen. Again, a pleasant good morning to everyone. Thank you Thank so you. much, Dr. Urbeta. So uh, that concludes our webinar this morning. And thank you once again for joining us and see you in our uh, next uh, webinar. Okay, so stay safe, everyone.